If your labor market is dependent upon, for growth, is dependent upon government and part-time, that is not a good sign. In August, the Bureau of Labor Statistics announced that 818,000 jobs that they had announced were created in 2023 didn't actually exist. I mean, that to me is just unbelievably astonishing. So the, the unemployment rate is low based on a low denominator, based on a lower labor pool. That's number one. Number two, is we have these constant provisions. You know, the IMF says that the average, uh, the average um, inflation rate for this year is 5.9, will be 5.9%. That's almost three times the central bank's own arbitrary targets. And yet they're cutting rates. So they're cutting rates ahead of bringing inflation down. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the EdgeJR Mining Guy over on X and of course your host for this channel. And I'm being rejoined again here by Adrian Day. He's the chairman and CEO of Adrian Day Asset Management. And we last spoke back in July at the Rick Rule Symposium in Boca Raton in person. Now we're doing it virtually, but it's a, it's a good time to catch up. A lot has happened since the summer. A lot of macroeconomic indicators have changed. And I'm curious what Adrian thinks is going to happen now. Gold seems to be a bit under stress or duress right now we've seen a bit of a correction almost 200 points uh in the gold price 200 dollars, which is a, is a decent move down but uh, we'll, we'll see if that whole gold picture is still uh in in place and whether we should be bullish or bearish here for gold in general but uh before I switch over to my guest, hit that like and subscribe button. It is the free way to support us, and we do tremendously appreciate it. Now, Adrian, it is great to have you back on the program. Thank you so much for joining me again. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Kai. You got me just as I was about to drink something. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was watching the second monitor, but uh, <laughs> no, I do appreciate you coming back on the channel, Adrian. We do have lots to discuss, and since we do have a bit of a hard cutoff, let, let's let's jump right in. We spoke in July. A lot has happened since. We've seen a first rate cut. We've seen a new president uh, elect in the U.S. Um, what are the macroeconomic indicators you're looking at, and what's the macroeconomic outlook right now? Well, as you say, an awful lot has changed. Um, what are the things I'm looking at? I mean, clearly we want to look at what the Fed's going to do. And a lot of that depends, you know, they've kept repeating the Federal Reserve. Uh, Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Fed, has continually repeated that they're very data dependent. And so um, I think this was even particularly clear l last month when they cut rates and um, people were asking about what they should expect for December, uh, November rather. And he said, um, no, December, sorry. And, uh, you know, he kept saying, we, we, we don't have any plan right now. It's all data dependent. So I think the data coming in, particularly on the inflation side and more importantly, perhaps on the employment side, I think that's going to determine you know, the near term on rates. So that's definitely something I'm looking looking at. Um, but, you know, I I mean, I, I don't know. We You're going to ask me about the election, I assume. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's certain things that I think are, are almost inevitable in the near term anyway. Um, obviously, with President Trump, uh, when, when he was elected, there's a lot of optimism on economic growth, uh, which means that the Fed could be slower in cutting rates, that's negative for gold. Um, there's a lot, and, and, and economic growth and, and slower rate cuts means a higher dollar. That's obviously negative for gold. Um, there are some concerns among some economists that his program will be inflationary, will add to inflation, but again, Inflation may be as good for gold, but inflation means that the Fed, again, will be slower in cutting rates. That's negative for gold. So all, all of these things um, on his election was sort of, uh, you know, the, 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 the sentiment, if you like, was that it was negative for gold. Um, and I certainly think that if you take the most optimistic view of of, of the next four years of, a, of Trump point two or 2.0, whatever they say, um, you know, we could indeed see more economic growth, 
uh, with Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy, you know, taking knives to um, uh, the bureaucracy and to waste and to overlap. Uh, there's an awful lot of that. I mean, they just, if the Pentagon had an audit, they just announced there's 800 billion that they don't quite know where it is. Well, I mean, uh, I have no question that with good intent, you know, with hard work, you can cut a lot of fat out the budget. Okay, so so the optimistic case is, is, is really, and, and that's if Trump stays on message and doesn't start tweeting angry thoughts at three o'clock in the morning. Um, but he's got good people around him. And, and that's what gives me optimism. I'm, I'm rambling, I'm sorry, but that's what gives me optimism because in his first, in his first um, uh, term, he had a few people like Steve Ban Bannon, uh, Bannon, Bannon, sorry. And then I'm thinking of the gold company. And then he also had like his chief of staff, John Kelly. Well, when John Kelly walked into him and said, President Trump, don't do this, you're an idiot. What does Trump do? He gets all mad and fires the guy. When I feel, when Elon Musk goes in and says, hey, you know, Donald, I think we ought to do this a different way. Maybe there's optimism to think he might listen. <laughs> so anyway, that's a long, so, so there might be optimism over four years. But in the near term, you know, we've still got inflation that's not at 2%. Uh, we've still got an economy that's slowing and unemployment that's moving up and jobs growth that is very slow. We've still got a budget deficit. We've still got a huge national debt. And again, even with the absolute best will in the world, you know, those two that I mentioned are not dictators. In fact, they don't have any power to cut anything. They're advisory roles. So even with the best will in the world, getting some of this stuff through Congress, you know, it's going to take time. So what I'm trying to say is that for the next year or two, I, I don't think the picture with regard to gold has really changed much. So most of our customers are just making individual purchases, but we have an option where people can sign up essentially for a monthly subscription or an automatic purchase. And the nice thing about the monthly plan is that you can just set it and forget it. You can put it on autopilot. You can sign up for a certain amount every month, whether it be gold or silver, whatever items you choose, and then give us a bank account uh, that you want us to process the transaction through, and what day of the month you want it done, and boom, you know, it happens automatically. We either ship it to you uh, or we can store it. Nearly 10,000 people in that program, and it's been a tremendous success and something we've offered from day one. We're really proud of that because it's very unique in our industry. Most people have not figured out a way to offer that kind of solution at scale the way we have. And it's a wonderful way to, to be saving in real money, gold and silver. It's very easy to enroll. You can do it through our website or over the phone. There's a minimum of only $100 a month. The maximum is really any, any amount. It's also easy to manage. Anytime you want, you want to make a change, you can do that. You can quit at any time. It's very user friendly. It's an interesting commentary because it seems like the market is in limbo. And uh, my gut feeling is that it has a lot to do with the Fed and maybe uncertain economic policies in the U.S. Um, the Fed, I want to highlight, is like st feels like stepped on the brakes here. Um, Powell, Powell said previously, yeah, we're going to have two more rate cuts this year. But now, like just in the last press conference, he stepped on the brakes like, nope, we're data dependent again, despite various articles and commentary that they're going to cut two, two, two more times anyway. So he, he's taken a step back. Uh, as well. And that's really closed or shut off the risk capital for our sector again, it feels like. It, it brought some more hesitancy because maybe to give some more color on previous interviews and after we spoke, Beaver Creek was a conference. I think we've seen each other there even. But um, there was optimism. And uh, a couple days after the conference or during the conference, actually, the, the Fed cut for the first time. And that brought some renewed optimism to our sector over the last you know, two months. And that has right. changed. Um, is, is that a right to sort of assumption? Is that, are we really that Fed dependent in the mining sector and the gold space? Um, well, I think it's partly Fed dependent, but it's also Trump. I, I, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm being careful what I say, because I, you know, I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to make this political, but 
you know, I think I think the election of Trump has has made people, you know, think that we can have a much stronger economic growth and we're cutting regulation, uh, we're cutting taxes and cutting regulation, we can have more productivity. So, you know, these things potentially are very, very powerful. Um, I think as powerful as, as say, Reagan in his first term. Um, uh, but but the Fed is another issue, and 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 if the Fed is data dependent and waiting to see what the data is all the way up through to their next meeting, then gold investors are not illogical to say we're going to kind of wait. Now, if I may just step back, you know we all know why gold went up over the last two years of so the central bank buying, and then. The beginning of this year, you had a huge, a huge pickup in, in Chinese consumer buying, right? And, and you had continued Western outflows. It really wasn't until July, August, September, and then particularly in October, that you started getting a change in that and, and Western inflows, very small in June, July, but pick, slowly picking up. And, and those Western inflows came in at precisely the time when central bank buying was slowing, easing, right, down, oh, I don't have the number in front of me, sorry, but down significantly, the third quarter was down significantly from the third quarter of last year, uh, I think down 50%. Um, now, last year was a record high, an all-time record high, um, but still, we're down significantly in the third quarter, and uh, Chinese buying collapsed, actually collapsed to its lowest, uh, its lowest quarterly number in 10 years, staggering from what they had been at the beginning of the year. So in the third quarter, you have central bank slowing and Chinese buying collapsing, still positive buying, still net buying, but collapsed from what it was. And fortunately, the Western investors started to come in and, and fill that void. But now that the Western investor has stepped aside, um, that's why we saw gold, you know, fall the way it did. Now, I'll make a point, if I may. You talked about $200. And you're right, of course, $200. You know, that's quite a lot. Yes, it is. But when you see gold has gone up from, from bottom to peak in the last two years, it went up 72%. And from top to bottom, that's a little bit before the election, but from top to bottom, it corrected about 7%. That's not a huge correction. And again, after two years when it had gone, when gold had gone pretty steadily up without much of a correction at all, and all we've done is gone back to the end of September. Again, I would say that's, I would say what we've seen is really a pretty modest pullback. I mean, it just, it just freaked us all out because <laughs> We were just about in, uh, beginning to enjoy the party, but isn't that the way it always goes? Yeah, the, the, yeah. We just lit the candles. That yeah. was pretty much it. Like absolutely. Like you know, I was quite euphoric about it, but uh, I was just at a conference last week in, in Zurich, and the mood. I, w I wouldn't say it was muted or anything, but there was not as much optimism as I thought there might be. It, it definitely quieted down, and not as euphoric as I was expecting it to be, which was a bit of a bummer, I have to admit, because I expected we're finally off, but uh, the US election, the Fed rate to pause, let's call it, I'm expecting a rate pause, by the way, in December. I think nothing's going to happen in December, um, is, has really put in a damper on things. Um, Adrian, well, I'll have you, I quickly want to talk about US sentiment, consumer sentiment real quick as well, because it is such a big factor in the US service-based economy, and that is picking up. Um, I'm bringing that up because we talked about recession fears in the U.S. in particular, and it doesn't feel like that anymore. It seems like the U.S. has dodged a bullet. I have to bring that up again. But what are your thoughts? Like unemployment seems to be in check. Inflation is in check. Uh, there's 3% GDP growth, if we all believe the, the numbers um, that are being presented to us, obviously. But uh, where, where do you stand on that? Like, is a recession still likely? I think a recession is still likely. I mean, you're absolutely right that there's been a pickup in sentiment. Um, no question, but you know, you know, we talked about employment. Let's just pick on employment. We talked about uh, this before, but you know, but uh, the headline numbers look reasonably good, other than the new jobs creation last month, twelve thousand jobs. I mean, that's basically nothing in an economy besides the U.S. 
But but let's not forget, number one, we've got a very low labor participation rate, which, you know, that's for people in the um, 25 to 55 year, age, year uh, age group who are actually in the employment pool, either working or looking for work. And we've got a low number. People have left the employment um, uh, people have left the employment pool. Some of that was after COVID, you know, 55, 60 year old people who uh, started working at home and said, you know what, I kind of like it, this, let's, let's not go back to work. Um, so we certainly had some of that. Um, so that's number one. And obviously if you reduce the uh, 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 denominator, then the denominator goes up. So you know, it all goes down, I should say. So the, the unemployment rate is low based on a low denominator, based on a lower labor pool. That's number one. Number two is we have these constant revisions. Uh, you know, in August, the Bureau of Labor Statistics announced that 818,000 jobs that they had announced were created in 2023 didn't actually exist. I mean, that to me is just unbelievably astonishing. And that was a one-time adjustment. Uh, as you know, they announced the, the uh, new jobs creation, and then a month later, you have the first revision, two months later, you have the second revision. This year, we've already lost the revisions, the regular revisions, have already lost another 324,000 jobs. So that's 818,000 last year that we didn't have, 324,000 we didn't have this year. So I would say that the, the if, if you look at the revised job numbers, they're not anywhere near as good as the, you know, original headline numbers that are put out. And then lastly, what I'd say, and this is really important, is that the vast, or not the vast, sorry, the majority, the majority of new jobs created over the last 18 months have been either government jobs, including local government, government jobs, or part-time jobs. And if your labor market is dependent upon, for growth, is dependent upon government and part-time, that is not a good sign. There are some people who like part-time jobs, but most people, especially if they have two part-time jobs, are, are doing it because they, they have to. Now, if we look at the uh, the U6 unemployment rate, which is based on historical on the historical data from 1980, or uh, it's 7.7 percent. It's way higher than the 4.2, right. 4.3 percent the government is feeding us these days, right? So there there is that that significant difference. That it feels more realistic the 7.7 percent, quite honestly. And if I look at the labor participation rate of 62.5 percent, uh, which is about five percent lower than it was in 2006, then uh, that that is a big discrepancy as well, um, right. if you look at it. So it's uh, interesting data we're, we're we're looking at here, Adrian. I think the other quick thing, if I may, the other thing that's yeah. very important. I'm not a socialist, far far from it. But you know, if you look at the lower half of the U.S. or the lower forty percent in terms of net income, uh, I mean, in terms of income or net assets, most of that forty percent don't have net assets, a negative net worth. But if you look at, at that lower 40%, they are struggling right now. And so we really do have this bifurcated economy. And when you only look at aggregate numbers, I think it can give you a very, very misleading picture about entire swaths of the, of the, of the um, country. Absolutely. No, Adrian, like, I want to come back to the debt situation in the US real quick. Trump said in his, in, in, it wasn't the inauguration, except in, it wasn't even the acceptance <laughs> speech, the, the, the speech the night off. I don't know what you call it, but uh, the speech the night of the election, he said, we're going to start paying down the debt, um, which uh, it's an interesting statement because we still need to figure out how he's going to finance the, all of that. Um, yes, there's going to be the Doge government, whatever you call it, entity or advisory role with uh, Elon Musk and Vivek. Oh, I always butcher his last name. I do apologize. Ramaswamy. Yep, I always, I always mispronounce it. I but uh, so I, ideally, they can cut quite a bit of fat from the budget, but that won't be enough to to finance growth. Um, I'm curious, Adrian, what your thoughts are. Like, how can he do that? How can he pay back debt and finance growth that he's promising? Well, look, if if everything comes together and goes well, 
I think there is a path to do this, not this year, next year, but probably we'll only begin to see how this is working in his last year in office. But I think there is a path. I mean, I just mentioned the, the, the audit of the Pentagon where they can't find 800,000. They don't know where it went. Now, I'm not suggesting for a second that that was stolen. I don't think there's a lot of corruption. I think there is just an awful lot of waste, an awful lot of um, duplication. Um, so, I mean, if, if you start to tackle some of those things, um, uh, we, we know that the um, procurement the procurement system for the uh, uh, Pentagon is just abysmal. You know, people spending, um, you know, $400 on a spanner. You know, there's all these sort of stories that come out. Um, and, and it's just, I, I think it's because there's no accountability. Um, so that's number one. Um, Vivek Ramaswamy over the weekend said they were going to start tackling of the waste in government contractors. And, and there's clearly a lot of excess spend in there. Um, so, I mean, I, I do think there's a lot of potential to cut spending without, even before you start tackling any of the actual programs. Right now, you know, 250,000, it goes to the Upper Rochester Lesbian Theater, um, uh, you know, whatever they call it, co-op. Yeah, we can get rid of that program, but that's nothing. But, you know, actually looking at, at big programs like Social Security and Medicare has to be done at some point. Has to be. Now, Trump said he's not touching either of those two, but there's still a lot of, of fraud in those programs. Um, there's still a lot of um, fraud on the part of doctors, fraud on the part of... Uh, individuals who are claiming disability when they're not what you and I would think of as disabled, uh, where they're still perfectly able to work. So a lot of opportunity. Now, if we can, so if we can do that, number one, if we can cut taxes, I'm a big believer in the Laffer curve. You know, you cut taxes, people pay more tax, cut the tax rate, people wind up paying more. Uh, cut regulation, for goodness sake, there is so much regulation. And then if you add on to that the ESG and DEI, which are rampant in government agencies, um, and they are just anchors on anchors on progress and growth. So I, I don't know, I, I'm, 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 I, I think there's an optimistic case to be made whether that's my base case or not is a different issue. Yeah. No, inter interesting. I think that sort of sums it up. You, we, we, we do need to talk about gold in particular um, a bit more because uh, you, you mentioned a lot of negative factors weighing on the gold price, and I'm going to throw in seasonality here as well. I'm curious what your thoughts yeah. are on that. Um, do, do you look at seasonality as a factor for you? Yeah, yeah, no, seasonality definitely. But what I have noticed with seasonality over the years is that it can change. And it was really interesting because I looked at the book that I wrote in 2013, I think I wrote the book, and I had a table on seasonality, and September was the best month of the year for gold. Well, if you look at the last 10 years since I wrote the book, since I wrote the book, September is the worst month of the year. <laughs> so these things change, and partly they change like all patterns. They change when people start to buy or sell around those established patterns and then they cease to have they cease to have value you know a lot of these patterns are logical they have a logic in them but if but again if participants if every participant knows it and trades around it buys in advance you know sells in advance whatever um it distorts the patterns but one thing I will say, though, and I do want to make sure I get this in, I've talked about the negatives, but, but look, if you look at the reasons people were buying gold over the last two years, have they changed? And the answer is no. Central banks were buying to diversify away from the dollar just because they've got too much dollar reserves in their, in their, in their reserves for uh, too many dollars in their reserves just for prudence but also because of weaponization of the dollar. Is that going to change? 
On the contrary, President Trump-elect or elect President, President-elect Trump has threatened to punish countries that, that try to move away from the dollar. So, so that approach is only going to speed up the process of countries trying to move away. So that's not going to change. China, are Chinese buyers, are they suddenly comfortable with the state of their economy? Are they comfortable with the, with the yuan? Do they feel comfortable leaving their money in the banks? Are they getting back into real estate? No. So even though the buying may be slower than we saw in January, February, it's still going to be a positive, a positive um, uh, uh, factor. Uh, the only thing that's changed there is that whereas in January, I could say, and they're not going to buy stocks because stocks have been on a straight line down for four years. Of course, that's no longer true. Uh, Chinese stocks had a bit of a pulse, of a pulse, uh, a bit of a pulse in, in August, September. So some of that buying will go into stocks, but they're not going to put their money in real estate or banks and they're not allowed to buy crypto. So gold is going to be a beneficiary. So those two big sectors are going to con- groups are going to continue to be buyers, and then if you look at West, what we we'll call Western buyers in in you know in a very broad category, are government debt levels? Are, are we suddenly going to have balanced budgets around the world? Are we suddenly going to find debt to GDP ratios are going to get down to thirty and forty percent instead of a hundred and hundred and fifty percent, hundred and thirty percent? No. That's not going to happen. Is inflation truly under control? I don't think so. Not here, not, not, not in the rest of the world. You know, the IMF says that the average, uh, the average um, inflation rate for this year is 5.9, will be 5.9%. That's almost three times the central bank's own arbitrary targets. And yet they're cutting rates. So they're cutting rates ahead of bringing inflation down. So all of those factors remain um, so, so at least for the next couple of years, I, I think people are going to. Con- so nothing has changed in people's thinking of why they why they want gold, why they need gold. No, good, good, excellent points. I, it, it seems like a wait and see approach. I think people are just there's a bit of uncertainty that we're tr- we need to get over that hump, that uh, uncertainty wall. I think we need to climb that the wall of worry. That's what it's called. Is the term we need to climb sure. a bit of a wall of worry here, um, Adrian. And last I, two, th- yeah. No, no, I was just going to say, I, like you, I'm not going to be at all surprised if we see another dip down to the 2,500, you know, 2,500, 2,520 level, where there is a good deal of support. There's yep. really no support at this level on the charts. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to bring quickly bring the mining stocks into the mix. We've just seen Q3 financials have come out uh, just over the recent weeks. Curious if you've taken a look at them, what your thoughts are, and to whether you're your sentiment in, in, in terms of the stock market, the mining stock market has changed at all uh, as well. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we did see some, we did see some reasonably good results from a lot of the companies, particularly on the cash flow, which I mean, isn't surprising given, um, you know, given the gold was much higher in the third quarter than the second quarter. I, I don't have a number in front of me, but it was like $200 higher. So the cash flow should be good. Cost, some of the companies were still, I would say, struggling with costs. We didn't really have cost blowouts. The only cost blowouts we had were from companies that had um, mining issue, operational issues, so the production was down. So therefore, the cost per ounce went up. Um, but certainly struggling with costs, I would say. So that was a little bit disappointing. What we did see was um, overall uh, pretty good debt reductions from a lot of companies, from the larger ones and the intermediate companies. A lot of companies put in that um, cash flow, the bonus cash flow that they got to reducing debt. Uh, we also saw a little bit of a pickup in, in share buybacks, but nothing particularly dramatic because, of course, as they got more cash in, which would facilitate the buybacks, the share prices were higher, so less attractive to buy back the shares. Yeah. Um, I, I think the companies, personally, I think the companies are right to focus on bringing debt down. 
Um, you, I've never heard a company in my entire history that said, man, why did we have so much cash on our balance sheet? What a friggin' mistake. But I, but also, I don't know too many, a lot of people say raise the dividend, raise the dividend. You know, you've got dividends of 1%, 2%. I don't know anyone who buys a stock because it's got a 1% dividend. Yeah. And if you raise that from 1% to 1.5%, is that going to make everybody flood into the stock? I don't think so. You don't buy, you don't buy gold mining stocks because of the dividends. No. So I think they're doing the right thing, unless it's a, a, a Wheaton or Franco with consistent, steady cash flow. Then it makes sense to have a dividend. So anyway, I think they're doing the right thing. Now, has my thinking changed? I mean, I'm... Right now, today, as we speak, I'm a little bit, I'd be a little bit cautious. I would wait uh, to add positions. Now, I'm saying that, bear in mind that we're already pretty fully invested. Anyone who's listened to me in my newsletter is pretty fully invested. So we're not talking about some guy who's just inherited a million dollars and has no exposure to gold at all. Yes, that person should certainly start stepping into the market. But, you know, if you're already pretty invested and you're looking to add to positions, I, I, I think there's still some risk on the downside. And we know if gold drops from 20, just over, well, if gold drops another $100, let's say, 80 to $100, we know the gold stocks will come down. Yeah, no, GDX, GDXJ is brutally underperforming the gold performance for the year, year to date. Or brutally exactly. is an exaggeration, but they're underperforming. So dollar cost average, I think, is the proper way to enter the market right now. Well, and, and, and I would look at, for myself, I prefer to look at specific stocks that I like. You know, I've got a list of stocks I like. Oh, and this one's down a lot because of this. Oh, this one's down a lot because of that. And try to build your portfolio that, that way. I mean, I think Franca right now, for example, is 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 very cheap it's selling at one of its lowest um one of its lowest valuation multiples you know in its history which admittedly they're always high <laughs> <laughs> but um and you know we shouldn't forget they do have what is now a free option on Cobra panama since they've written it off it's now if you like a free option that's a good point Adrian, I know you have a hard cutoff. I know you have to run. You have another appointment. Um, so I'm well, going to let you go. But I thank you so much for your time. As, as always, it's very insightful. Where can we follow you, Adrian? I was going to say it's a dentist. So if you want to keep me here, I'm happy. <laughs> um, yeah, it's adrianday.com. Fantastic. Adrian, as always, it's a tremendous pleasure to catch up with you. And uh, we'll have to get you back on early January just to get a bit of an outlook for 2025, of Absolutely. course, in the books and uh, everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you haven't done so, please hit that like and subscribe button. It helps us out tremendously. And it is a free way to support us. It doesn't cost you a thing. What do, what do you think gold is going to do over the next uh, six to seven weeks here until the inauguration in the U.S.? Uh, let, let us know. We'll figure it out together. And thanks so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots more. Thank you.